you know, people don't think that once you get out of prison, you ain't nothing but jail bait, you're going right back in, but people, you don't know what they are on the inside. You don't know what their heart is telling them what they need to do. Give them the chance. If you don't give them a chance, they ain't gonna never make nothing. And she's got the chance and she is one, she's in, in front of the herd. She's up front, she's the leader. Welcome to our fifth episode of the 98% Life After Prison, a show about the roughly 95 to 98% of incarcerated North Carolinians who will eventually be released back into their communities and why that should matter to all of us. The voice you heard at the top of the show is that of Tommy Scales talking about his wife and my podcast partner, April. We're dedicating this episode to April's advocates, the people who fought for her freedom and have supported her since her release. We're going to learn about the crime that sent April to prison in the first place, but first, we'll hear from her longtime lawyer and friend, Kristen Parks. April, is there anything you want to say about Kristen before we listen to her interview? I've known Chris for 27 years. I've known her before her children were born and when she was in the beginning of her career as being an attorney. She could not help me um, from what she filed in 97, but she has remained in my life since then, and I am so grateful to have Chris in my life. Okay, let's listen to the interview with you and Kristen Parks. Well, this is another episode of Advocates, and I'm about to interview my longest and dearest friend and the longest advocate that I've ever known in my life, my friend, Kristen Parks. So, Chris, um, tell me about how you met me. Well, I first met you in 1997 when I was an attorney at Prisoner Legal Services, and I believe that our office was helping you with some issues you were having with getting to see your son Colt more often, and I began representing you on an appeal of your conviction. And uh, how would you describe um, the relationship you have with me? Uh, Now I just think we're really good friends, and we're neighbors, and we get to see each other and talk a lot and walk together and help each other just like friends and neighbors do. Um, What made you advocate uh, for me? Well, when I was at Prisoner Legal Services, we got hundreds of letters per week with people who needed help very desperately. But your case stuck out because I thought it was so unfair. The treatment you got when you were going through the court system and the kinds of things you were told and not told by your lawyer. And, um, you know, the very idea that we would lock up a child for two life sentences running back to back. And so uh, once I heard about your case, uh, it was just something that I wanted to work on and see through. And how do you think I've adjusted since my release? Oh, your adjustment has been pretty (laughs) miraculous. (laughs) Um, you came home with goals and you are up at the crack of dawn and stay up much later than I do working really hard to achieve your goals. And I think you've done that. You know, you have, um, enjoyed life and being outside and exercising and getting to know the world around you, but you're also doing really meaningful work. And I think, That was the main goal that you had when you were released. I think your biggest challenge has probably been coming to terms with how you expected the world to be and how you thought the world was and seeing how the world really is. Anywhere from, you know, little everyday things about how life works to just sort of bigger meaning kind of issues. So is there anything that you want the audience to know about me or the situation that brought us together that um, I haven't mentioned so far? Well, I think in, in my experience with you, your drive has always been based on your son. 
And that's how we first met when you were in prison. You were trying to get more time with your son. You wrote him constantly. You worked toward a life where you could be out and be part of his life. And I think the really awesome thing is now you're out and I've just never seen a mother and son who are so close. And the way you talk and care about each other and support each other is really just amazing. You met me at the very beginning. Um, So in 1997, I would have been in my teens. How am I different now as opposed to back then? Well, when I first met you, you were an advocate for yourself for sure, but definitely a young, scared kid. You were a new mother and you were just desperate to have as much time as possible with your son. I think you were also um, scared in your own way of being in prison with all these older women who had been there a long time and who were going to be there a long time. And it was hard for you to navigate just all the personalities and all of the drama and all of the rules. That's a really hard thing for a teenager to do. Um, You've been an attorney for a long time, and since me, you have came across a lot of cases, but mine stood out to you. Do you believe that my case was different um, compared to all the others, and do you have any statistics that can back up your findings? Well, your case was different because it was you, and you're just a really exceptional kind of person, but when we look at kids in North Carolina and around the country who are given extreme sentences. um, Those kids have very similar backgrounds and they're similar to yours. Over 90% of the kids that enter the criminal system have experienced abuse or or neglect. Um, 79% witness violence in their home and nearly half of them witness physical abuse. Among women sentenced to life without parole and really long sentences, 77% of those reported having been sexually abused. We also know that the incarceration of a parent is an adverse childhood experience, and that kind of thing poses a real threat to a child's emotional and physical and educational well-being. And so all of the statistics that we now are learning through a lot more study in this area. I can see that in your life and how you grew up and sort of what led you to become incarcerated at just 15 years old. And we also know that adolescents are much more able to rehabilitate themselves. So we know how the brain works and that kids are especially receptive to rehabilitation and early intervention. So the thing about incarcerating kids when they're so young is unless we give them a chance to rehabilitate, to do better, to make something of their lives and themselves, it's a real waste. April, you and I have spoken briefly about your childhood, but the audience has really no understanding of your circumstances as a child or what sent you to prison. Um, What was your childhood like? I had a very restricted childhood. Um, Even though I was very academically gifted, I wasn't allowed to do a lot of things that children would normally do like going to the the movies or spending the night over at a friend's house. I couldn't do anything that was unaccompanied by an adult. My mother had me when she was 16, and because of that, she never really um, grew up and wanted to fulfill her responsibilities of a mother. So my grandmother raised me, uh, my grandparents raised me, and along with um, her not Uh, fulfilling her responsibilities as a mother. She also uh, eventually led a life of crime and drugs. 
So your grandparents, I assume, were trying to protect you from that. Yeah, because of that, I was just a very restricted child. I mean, they did the best that they could and what they had to work with and, and under the circumstances. But um, I was just a very restricted child, so I didn't, I didn't gain a lot of freedom until I was about 14. Oh, okay. So, um, and when you were 14... How did that freedom feel, and and what happened? Well, I read the newspaper. I was very uh, good academically and scholastically, so I read the newspaper, and I came across this summer job at my soon-to-be high school, and it was about it was a job training partnerships of America, and I met this guy who was bringing his ex sister-in-law at the time. Now her name was also April, and we began to be friends. His name was CL. The problem was that this man was 15 years older than me. I was 14 and he was 29. So we began to sneak around after, um, you know, a day or so. And that was just kind of the beginning uh, of the end. Beginning of the end in what way? Can you explain that? Uh, The beginning of and the end of, well, life as I knew it as a teenager, um, I was pregnant. Uh, Eventually, we snuck around for like a year and a half. I got pregnant. My grandparents suspected that I was pregnant and gave me two options, either force me to have an abortion or get this man that I was now madly in love with for a statutory rape. So he devised a plan that was just supposed to be to scare them. He brought over gasoline. We poured the gasoline and it led to the results of of their deaths. And also two life sentences for me. Now, what it was supposed to do was scare them. And and in like a Lifetime movie where everyone is just so loving and accepting and everyone is on the the lawn hugging and and all that stuff and have to a happy ending. But it didn't end well. It ended in their deaths. Oh, April, that that sounds so tragic. Mm. Um. You found yourself at the age of 15 as a result of their deaths, facing two life sentences, and you'd lost your grandparents. I had lost my grandparents, the people that raised me. I was now arrested. I was also pregnant. So, And then they had arrested my boyfriend. So it was just a whole lot of teenage emotions that was going on, like what was going to happen to me, what was going to happen to the baby, where was my boyfriend, when would I see him? You know, I was still thinking that everything in some way was going to be okay in the end. Because you were 15. When, yeah. when I was like 16, I rode on the hood of a car thinking that that was a good idea. Yeah. I fell off and, and yeah, I paid the consequences. You think that you know at mm-hmm. that age. That's what's so dangerous. You definitely think you have the answers. The rational side of your brain doesn't develop until 25. And sometimes even at that age, we still don't have the answers. April, thank you for sharing your story. Um, I think it means a lot, and you are definitely not the same person that you were then. Uh, You grew up (laughs) into an amazing woman. And, um, yeah. (laughs) So we're going to move on and hear from another advocate of April's. This is Kathleen Joyce. And Kathleen Joyce has been in April's life for 17 years. And um, she was just a law student when you met Kathleen. Can you tell me a little bit about her? Well, when I met Kathleen, um, she was someone who uh, began to help me write things to prepare to try to get um, help from the media or just different places. And she was practicing family law at the time. She eventually changed to criminal law and juveniles because she related my life to um, her teenage daughters at the time and uh, thought that her work would better be served working with juveniles. That's quite a story. Let's hear from you and um, Kathleen. Uh, For the record, um, your name is? Kate Joyce. And tell me about the little relationship that you have with me. Oh, well, I love talking about that. Um, April came into my life in 2007. At that time, I'm a second career person lawyer. And um, so I was in law school in 2007 at, at UNC. 
I responded to a post from Chris Parks where she said that she uh, needed some pro bono assistance. So I met with Chris and she said, I remember her gesturing toward her heart as she laid out this file for me. And she said, this is April and um, I need someone to help me with April. And she told me about, she told me April's story and it was clear, you know, what a personal connection Chris had and, you know, how much she believed in April. And, you know, I remember sitting there and it was, the idea was, okay, we have to get April out. <laughs> and um, it, it, it took a good amount of time, but um, as we know, it, it uh, eventually was successful. One of the things that um, I, I also remember from that early period is um, April's son, Colt, was still in high school at that time. And it turned out that my oldest daughter um, is the same age as Colt. And so I, I just always felt very connected to April based on that because I thought, wow, here we were pregnant at the same time. You know, I was married in my late 20s. She was this kid and, um, and, and she had to give birth in prison and give up her son right away. And, and, you know, my, my kids are so precious to me that I, I just, again, felt that connection and, um, it made me feel even, you know, more urgency about, about helping her. What made you advocate for me and remain in my life? Well, I think um, the thing about April is that she needed connections on the outside, like, you know, what Chris and I offered, but she was the engine. You made it all happen. And that you never gave up on yourself. You never gave up on Colt. And so it would be impossible for me to give up on, on you because, you know, you're the intelligence and the um, just the doggedness, the, the persistence. I mean, you know, I would be looking at things legally and be like, you know, head in my hands, even though there was, there was so much wrong with what happened and how April was, was treated by the um, judicial system at the time of her uh, conviction and sentencing, there was, no, we couldn't find uh, a way. And, and so, you know, I, I, despaired and thought, well, I don't see how this is ever going to happen. And, you know, April didn't take, she, she didn't despair because she, every time a door was closed, you know, she found the window. And so I don't, I just don't think that anyone who knew her through those years could have, have given up trying because, she was never giving up and she needed to be out because you could, I could tell that she would be the person she has shown herself to be over the past year. You know, um, she's not leaving anybody behind that, you know, she is using her knowledge to, to advance other people's, the cause of, of, you know, her friends who, who are still incarcerated. So um, she can do, I knew she could do so much out here and she's, she's proving that that's true. In late March, April's advocates took her to dinner to celebrate her first year of freedom. Kristen and Kate were both there, as was Carmen Johnson. April, can you tell us who Carmen is and why you consider her such an important advocate? Carmen was my 
a reentry uh, council person. The first one that I received uh, when I first got out of Orange County, she was only there in, in, in an interim basis because the one that was supposed to be on um, my case manager on my on her caseload was out on maternity leave. But Carmen is just the nicest, most caring uh, person. She has a background in social work, and it really shines through with the work that she does. Okay. Let's listen to the interview that you did with Carmen Johnson. For the record, Ms. Johnson, can you state your full name? Carmen Camelia Johnson. Um, and what is your relationship with me? Can you tell me how we met? Uh, I met April. April... I think the 28th of 2022, which was about approximately a a month after her release. I was the Orange County local reentry case manager at the time. Well, since then, can you tell me um, or can you describe the relationship that we've developed, if possible, um, sum it up in a paragraph? The relationship we've developed. Well, initially, uh, you know, my role was advocacy to advocate for you and and to help with your reentry uh, into Orange County into society. Um, I, I think I played more of a mentor role with you. Uh, at this point, you're just more like the annoying little sister. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your A team has you spoiled. No, actually, <laughs> you. I, I would say uh, more of a mentor role. And what made you advocate for me and remain in my life even after your job was done? Oh yeah, that's that's easy. You're you're phenomenal. Yeah, you're an exceptional young lady. I, I knew that from the very first meeting. Um, just your presence, you know how well spoken you are. You're you're intelligent, and just the, your drive and determination that all the things that you learned and all the things you accomplished while you were in prison. I was just blown away. I'm very impressed by uh, your you as a person. So it's easy to remain uh, connected with you. How do you think um, that I've adjusted? Quite well. Surprisingly so. Um, you know things that I didn't think you'd, you'd know. Uh, I guess you were really paying attention to current events and did a lot of reading while you're in there. But, you know, that goes without saying with all the certifications that you that you have. Um, what do you think has been my biggest challenge thus far? Jeez, probably pacing yourself, trying to get you to slow down a little because you're ready to go on to the next thing. You know, it's. It's, it's like Rome wasn't built in the day, April. Calm down. So take it a little slower. You're going to accomplish everything you ever wanted, but it's like you want it right now. That's why I say hey, little bratty sister. <laughs> and is there anything that you would like the audience to know about me that hasn't been discussed so far? Uh, well, yeah, you, you're a jack of all trades and a master of all, actually. You've done some of everything. I, like I say, first time I met you, I was blown away at all the things that you accomplished while you were in. Um, I don't think people know exactly what you've been up to. I mean, you, uh, you're a personal trainer. You have certification in that. You have certification in cosmetology. Um, you care for the elderly. Uh, right now, that's actually your job. Uh, you work with individuals with dementia, and that's a special place in 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 my life because my mother had dementia, and I just recently lost her. So. Um, you, you do some of everything. So I don't think people know that. You know, we all know that you're an author. We all know that you're an advocate and that's your passion, but you do so many other things. We're going to close out this show about advocates by listening to perhaps April's closest advocate, her husband of 10 years, Tommy Scales. Is there anything that you want the audience to know about me that we haven't discussed so far? She's an individual. She wants to pay her way, in other words. 
She don't want you to pay anything or buy her this. She want to work and get the money and pay for it herself. Everything she got, she paid for herself. I helped, but she fusses at me. But I still help because I love her. I'm behind her 100%. If she falls, I fall. And if I can't catch her and we both stand strong, then we'll both have to fall. She is one determined young lady. Well, thank you, hubby, for your wonderful interview. And I hope the audience will tune in next time to hear another story about an advocate and or a formerly uh, incarcerated individual. So this has been April Barber with the 98% Life After Prison podcast. See you next time.